a very brief, uh, maximum nine minute uh, introduction to what Arch Materials is doing in the semiconductor space um, in collaboration or uh, in engagement with uh, ANV. Uh, for some of you in the audience, uh, the building in the background will actually look familiar. That's the Sydney Nano Hub at the University of uh, Sydney from where we do some of our work. All right, uh, in the beginning of my talks, I would like to have a mission slide and um, the job of this slide is that if you take nothing else away from this talk, and it does happen, at least uh, have this one takeaway point. And for this talk, it's that Archer is uh, developing advanced uh, devices in the semiconductor space, and they're based on carbon nanomaterials, and that's done for quantum hardware, as well as diagnostic devices uh, for human health applications. Now, who's Archer Material? We're an Australian company focused on the development of advanced semiconductor devices, and we have projects, as I just mentioned, in quantum computing hardware, uh, a project that we dubbed the 1-2-CQ project, as well as uh, biotechnology, uh, the development of a lab on a chip device. Our company is headquartered in Adelaide, but all the R&D and tech development is done uh, from Sydney. We have just under 20 employees, the majority of whom are PhDs and researchers. So you'll appreciate that with um, that number of employees, Archer is what they call fabless and labless. Instead, this is obviously not uh, a job you do in your garage. We get access to that sophisticated infrastructure uh, through targeted collaboration as well as uh, research services agreements uh, with organizations such as ANV. Now, um, don't worry, I'm not going to try to convince you to invest, but I just want to mention that Archer is listed on the Australian Stock Exchange and at the end of last year we raised about $25 million. And the reason I mentioned that is to highlight that we really do have the funding to drive forward the development over the coming years. So in terms of the uh, external engagements on the left hand side, uh, see, you see us um, when we look all very fancy. And on the right hand side, you see uh, some of the key organizations and institutes that we engage with. So in Sydney, that's uh, predominantly the UNSW as well as the University of Sydney. And out of the eight ANF nodes, we use the ones that are centered or housed at these two universities. We also have international collaborations and um, the most important one amongst those is EPFL in Lausanne and Switzerland. So in terms of Arch's engagement uh, with ANF, we started working with ANF about three and a half, year, half years ago. At the beginning, it was only uh, myself. And since then, we've grown. Uh, so at the moment, we have about seven people or employees that use ANF facilities uh, pretty much on a daily basis. And so ANF doesn't just allow us to go in and use state-of-the-art instrumentation and tools, but we also uh, have access to highly skilled individual technicians that have helped us um, address some of the fabrication challenges that we face uh, for our project. Again, as I mentioned before, we've got the 1-2-CQ uh, quantum hardware project, and this is really focused on the development of an electron spin-based qubit in a carbon nanomaterial. On the other hand, for human health, we have the development of a graphene-based uh, biosensor, so that's a graphene-based uh, field effect transistor for the detection of human pathogens. So if you look at those two projects, I mean, they may seem kind of disparate, but if you think about it, at the end of the day, it really comes down to a need for uh, fabrication as well as metrology of electronic devices at the nanoscale. And this is what ANF uh, helps us to do. And so I want to spend the next couple of slides to really just give you uh, a very brief uh, introduction to some of the devices that we pattern uh, at ANF. So let me introduce the materials that's at the heart of our quantum uh, technology. What you see on the left hand side there is an SEM image of the material which we refer to as carbon nanoonions. They come in powdered form and they're highly disordered uh, graphitic nanosystems. So roughly spherical um, and roughly uh, 40 nanometers in diameter with quite a narrow size distribution. And those nanoonions have a couple of very interesting properties for the sake of our project. Um, the interesting ones is on these nano onions, you have electrons that are delocalized over the volume of these spheres, and those electrons uh, have the property that they have quite long spin lifetimes if you measure them at room temperature. And so this is what's demonstrated by that graph. I'm not going to go into details, but essentially those are called uh, Rabi oscillations. Um, those were taken, that data was taken at room temperature on bulk quantities, so trillions of trillions 
uh, of those carbon nano onions. And what that demonstrates is that if you do electron spin resonance measurements, you can really uh, controllably perform uh, quantum coherent operations at room temperature. So the idea at that stage was to try and exploit that and turn this material into a viable qubit architecture. And so the, the first step on that, you know, arguably long road towards a qubit is to find a method to reliably isolate individual ones of these carbon nano onions and then uh, pattern them into a chip-based device, a uh, functional device. And so uh, what you see on the, um, the micrograph on the left-hand side is where one of these nano onions has been positioned on a piezo-driven micromanipulator. Uh, that tool is installed inside of a uh, scanning electron microscope. And with this uh, method, uh, the right-hand side shows an example device where several of those have been patterned on a silicon surface between uh, control electrodes, and that was done with nanometer scale precision. Um, in addition to just making those devices, it also opens, so this method of patterning and positioning uh, carbon nano onions opens the pathway towards more interesting types of measurements, and one of them is indicated by that um, picture on the right hand on the top, where we have managed to measure the transport, electronic transport, through just a single one of those carbon nano onions. And the reason that's uh, important and interesting for us is because it really allows us to uh, get more information about the electronic structure of the material. So th that's a very similar instrument. We have several of these nanoprober tips, and you can measure uh, two terminal IV traces. Now it's one thing to do that inside, in situ of an SEM, but of course it becomes more interesting if you are able to translate that to chip-based devices. And that's what's shown uh, on the lower panel and the right-hand side, where we've done exactly uh, that. And so this is a more sophisticated transport device. The advantage of that is twofold. So on the one hand, you can do that externally, uh, and at the second, uh, on, on the other hand, you're also able to um, measure at cryogenic devices, and it really, for us, opens a road towards uh, readout. The very last slide um, is uh, what I've shown you before, is that you can do ESR measurements on bulk quantities of the material, but at the end of the day, the qubits will be defined just by a single carbon nanoonion. Now, spin is an elusive quantity that's not easy to measure, so we had to find a method to uh, perform ESR on an individual carbon nanoonion, which is shown, uh, or just schematically shown, uh, on the top uh, right here. So essentially it's uh, based on a superconducting planar resonator that's patterned on a silicon substrate. And if you look at the lower panel, that's uh, actually one of those resonators that was patterned at ENV, where we have positioned at this moment not a single one, but um, a cluster of about 100,000 carbon nano, and this we're actually able to get a spin signal. And this is my finishing slide. Again, I'm not a biologist, I'm a physicist. But this is the types of devices that we're dealing with for the Human uh, Health Project, where we have a graphene field effect transistor. It's patterned on an SOI uh, substrate, and uh, graphene FETs have the nice uh, property that they're very sensitive to anything that happens on the surface. So the idea is uh, you cap the entire GFET, or a graphene field effect transistor, with a protective layer, and then you form those uh, micron-sized wells, and then you can use a liquid gating technique uh, to detect, quantitatively detect human pathogens um, in a liquid. And that brings me to the end of my talk and uh, say thank you. Hi, um, anyone have a question after that amazing presentation? Um, how are you fabricating or creating the onions? Yeah, so, so those are created in the lab. Uh, nano onions have been, uh, you know, they're always a byproduct of combustion, um, uh, like reactions. We uh, do a chemical reaction, it's the pyrolysis of hydrocarbon, which is just the chemist's fancy way of saying we burn some um, organic stuff. They've actually also been found in meteorites, but yeah, we have a simpler method. Sean. I'm just curious if there's any way to grow them place rather than place them? Yeah, so that's a very good question. So yes, you'll appreciate that this pick and place method you can use for, you know, maybe maybe 10 or 20 uh, carbon nano onions. But if you want to pattern them into more complex structures that will rely on hundreds and thousands of those, you're not going to use that method. And so instead, we're going to make use of the rich carbon chemistry for organic materials. And so we actually have a program, not with ANF, uh, ANF at the moment, that is focusing on functionalizing the surface and then pattern them in a self-assembly type method uh, into arrays.
Thank you.